name's Kelly and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about amphibians and climate change. And uh, there's a little guy, my ponds are drying up. So, is it a race against time? First of all, I, can I just do a quick poll? How many of you guys, when I say climate change, honestly, think about amphibians? So, none of you. Yeah, so that's pretty standard from what I've gathered. Is it's not the first thing that comes to mind when people say climate change, and that is something that needs to change. Okay, so first off, I want to start by defining climate change. Climate change often gets confused with global warming, but they're not the same thing. Climate change is actually defined as, as a statistical change in weather patterns over a period of time. Now, that can be a couple of decades to over a millennia. Whereas global warming is largely considered, at the moment, to be man-made. Um, so basically, global warming can contribute to climate change, but it's not necessarily. But climate change is not necessarily global warming. Climate change can be global cooling. It can be changes in weather patterns. It can be more extreme weather. It can be milder weather. We're, some people may even argue that we're in the middle of climate change anyway, as we're coming out of a mini ice age. Second of all, amphibians. Everyone's heard of amphibians, you all know what they are. There are three, uh, three groups, the anurans, which are frogs and toads, the uridellans, which are newts and salamanders, and the apoda, which are sasalians. Now, these are an absolutely ancient order. They've been around since the Devonian period with the, um, people believe the first amphibian to be a, an organism called the tiktalic, which was the first tetrapod. So they've been around longer than dinosaurs, basically. So absolutely ancient. They have survived many mass extinction events, such as the Permians, uh, the Permian extinction, the KT extinction. They have survived climate change before, such as the Pleistocene. So as well, everyone knows the basic life cycle. So egg, tadpole, tadpole to uh, aquatic larva, aquatic larva to terrestrial adult. Some of these, as you'll see on here, some of them do keep a stage where they retain juvenile characteristics. This can be called neoteny, but in, for the purpose of this, I'm going to call it, um, I'm going to refer to them as pedomorphs. Now, these pedomorphs are sexually active, and probably the most common one that people know about is the axolotl. Okay, so this is a graph that was prov uh, provided by Walls, Baricevic and Brown. Um, this talks about the predicted effects of two types of changes in weather patterns, uh, specifically on the mole salamander. But it can be attributed to a lot of other amphibians. So the effects of drought, so less rainfall, is in brown. The effects of deluge, which is more rainfall, in blue. And then you've got the negative effects and positive effects in red and green, respectively. So as you can see, there are a lot of diff there are a lot of changes that can come about in um, amphibian habitats through just two kinds of changes in weather patterns. This species of frog is called the Wallum sedge frog, and it was looked in at a, uh, a paper by Low, Cassidy and Hero, which is actually uh, being published uh, about, about now. Um, the Wallum sedge frog um, requires temporary wetlands in which to breed. So those are bodies of water that don't exist all year round. So they need, a, they need to breed, they need a time period of rainfall that normally happens seasonally. But with climate change, obviously changes in weather patterns, those temporary wetlands aren't always there or they're there for too long. But what Low Castley and Hero found in this particular species was that this frog would alter its breeding behaviour to coincide with those changes. This frog would breed earlier in the year or later in the year, depending on the water, uh, on the water availability. And it would also... Uh, the time between hatching and when it would uh, metamorphose, metamorphose sorry, from a tadpole to an adult, the times in the, between those periods was, rel was shorter relative to rainfall. They also found that the breeding coincided with low predator abundance due to um, drought and or deluge. 
So these, this particular species is showing an adaptive breeding strategy in relation to climate change. The next species is the mole salamander. Um, this particular species does have a pedomorphic life stage. And, uh, but Walls, Rich, Fitch and Brown found that uh, this particular species, in drought years, 90% of them, which is a huge amount, would skip breeding in favour of metamorphosing into the terrestrial adult life stage. Uh, this would uh, increase dispersal to help them find different bodies of water in which they could then breed. So this, this, um, this could be seen as a positive because there was increased dispersal, so there was, they were managing to increase their gene outflow. However, it's also seen as a negative because there is an entire life stage which um, is being cut out due to drought. This is a Sicilian. Uh, this is called the Boulanger's Sicilian. It is a limbless subterranean tropical amphibian. Not many people have seen these. A lot of people call them giant purple earthworms, as you can see. Um, these live in the top, this particular species lives in the top 30 centimetres of soil. And uh, what uh, Nisi and Barrow found was that this species would, um, where it was in the soil, would uh, the, and the abundance of them would fluctuate with seasons and particularly with air temperature. Now while these people weren't actually looking at effects of climate change, there was so little information about Sicilians out there available to, um, to people that are looking at, this, at the relationship between amphibians and climate change that you can only infer what would happen. But I, um, I would believe that climate change would severely affect these because they need the, the water within the water within the tropical soil in able to, um, to keep their eggs moist to breed. So you have to ask the question, are they adapting fast enough? So along with climate change, amphibians also have this massive group of different um, threats to them. They... So the previous examples were great examples of how amphibians are able to adapt to uh, changes in their environment and changes, to, changes in climate. However, not all of them are coping. I don't have a picture of one, but the marble salamander um, is not coping at all. This, that species lays its eggs at the water's edge which in years where there is early rainfall or in years where um, there is too much rainfall, the eggs do not receive the trigger they need in order to hatch, leading to egg mortality. In which case, if this happens uh, on, a, you know, on subsequent years over a period of time, their breeding rate drops dramatically and they probably would not be able to sustain a viable population. This is the most recent record of possibly extinct and possibly extinct in the wild species of amphibians. This is the largest group of amphibians to have gone extinct. I say of amphibians to have gone extinct. This is the largest group of fauna to have gone extinct. But this is the only the known species. We don't actually know how many species there are out there. So this is, this is only a snapshot of what is actually going on. As to add, to add to that, that's... Um, the IUCN red list amphibia category of threatened spe of number of threatened species for amphibians. I'd just like to draw your attention to the last enlarged box, which is DD, which is data deficient. So that's just to add what I was saying about how how much we don't know about this order of animals. Now, as well, I'd like to draw attention to the last one. I can't pronounce that that word. <laughs> Gymnophiona or something, but that's the Apolis, that's the Sicilians, and it looks like they're not, they're doing quite well. None of them are critically, it says none of them are critically endangered, none of them are possibly extinct. But then if you look at the data deficient, we don't actually know. So we don't, we're not able to tell how climate change is actually affecting these animals because we don't have enough research. Okay, so climate change from this graph you can see well I say graph this image you can see that climate change has been relatively constant it happens all the time we know it's happened but 
As you can see from about the Cambrian period, it's estimated that climate change has been relatively stable. It's, it does have massive fluctuations, but it's quite calm. However, if you look to the top, with, from uh, the Oglier scene, and particularly this quaternary period, you can see just how erratic climate change has become. Now, it's widely believed that this is due to human activity. Uh, I forgot my place. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I've said um, amphibians, you can see on there, amphibians have been around since around the Silurian period, or the Devonian period. So they have survived climate change before. However, it is believed that it is the sudden rapid changes in climate that is not giving them the time that they need, such as they've had before, to be able to adapt. And this is because of, like I say, human activity. So it is down to us that these changes are happening and that amphibians aren't coping. So there are some there are some theories as to how the world will turn out if we were to lose amphibians. And one of the most daunting is that uh, insect populations will overrun and we might end up with something looking like this. I mean I know that's an ad for um, is it Vancouver Aquarium, but it's a very shocking image of what could happen if we were to let amphibians go extinct because of climate change. So in summary, climate change is affecting amphibians. They have a really high extinction rate, which is estimated to be around 40%. There have been some observed changes in amphibian behavioural ecology, but the fact is, we simply don't know, because more research needs to be done. So, any questions? Thank you. Mm. Do you reckon if we gave them temporary water, that would... Do you mean, like, captive breeding, or do you mean going out like and... Like, going out in the wild and, you know, like, bucketing some water <laughs> in the area, <laughs> you know what I mean? Not necessarily... It's a difficult one, because that would be... it would. If we were to do that, we would be providing what they need, but then at the same time, we could get it horribly wrong and give them something that could affect the entire ecology of the area. So we might end up saving the amphibians, but at the same time, destroying the fish population. So it's, it's tough. You need to maybe, in order to save these amphibians, we need to change, all, we need to change our entire behaviour towards them. We need to change opinions towards them and get people thinking about this thing, because like I said, like I said, with climate change, it is well. It's widely believed that it is humans that are doing it. So we need to change that. So before, more than anything, before we can actually start addressing the smaller issues. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned you mentioned um, that humans are causing climate change. Mm. What do you reckon we could be doing to try and reduce it to prevent the extinction? First thing, obviously, we need to reduce um, carbon emissions because um, it's believed that uh, climate change is coming about through global warming this time. So that is an increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causing a greenhouse effect, which heating and heating up the earth, so not enough heat being able to pass off the earth. And then obviously with the uh, reducing um, <laughs> the, the ice, I can't remember what it's called, but it's an effect where the, the ice caps reflect the heat off of the earth, but because there's less of them, uh, there's less of that, there's not enough heat coming off the earth. So um, the first thing that we need to do in order to address that is reduce our carbon emissions, whether that's through developing um, more sustainable energy sources, whether that's through um, stopping using petrol which, um, and oil and plastic production, which I doubt, but it, at least if you reduce it, or at least find some way to make, uh, to turn the, car the carbon emissions into something else that is, isn't harmful, which I'm not sure if it's possible, but it's a thought. I do know that there is um, one country which is using its carbon emissions when it's um, doing it's, it's burning, it's, I think it's like Sweden or somewhere, and they're burning their 
uh, their waste to produce energy, but they're also somehow capturing the carbon emissions off of that so that it's not being released. I'm not sure what they're doing with it, but it's they reduce their carbon footprint just by doing that. Yeah. Are there any like active conservation projects that are happening now that are having a strong positive effect? Or? It's hard to tell. Uh, there is Save the Frogs, which was the, the first poster. They're doing okay. And then obviously there are the, the typical ones. Like There was a massive push when um, the golden frog was endangered through Catridium Arcos, which you've probably heard of with David Attenborough. But there's not, compared to other animal groups out there, there's not a lot. Because people don't see them as something to save really. They don't really think about them because it's like, oh, they're slimy or ooh, whatever. They're not fluffy and cuddly, so people don't really think about them that often. So compared to other groups out there, there's not a lot, and there's not a lot of interest in actually helping them, which is sad because, like I said, they've been around for ages. They've more than earned their right to exist, and it's because of us that they're dying out. So there are some out there, like, like I say, like safer frogs, but there need to be more. Thank you.